Southwest. It's, it's a little more like Manhattan. <laughs> Millions of people descend on our downtown. Well, it's also the first time after pandemic, right? Because it didn't happen last year. Yeah. West. It's, it's a little more like Manhattan. <laughs> Millions of people. Yeah. Uh, Corey, I think um, we're ready. We're streaming. Everything's going. Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. I'll turn it over to uh, Associate Professor Beeg. Great. Thank you, Clay. Uh, hi, I'm Corey Beeg. I'm a program director for architecture here at the University of Texas at Austin. And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Jing Lu. We are fortunate to have Jing uh, not only open our lecture series this year, but also for her to join us on our faculty as a visiting professor and the Ruth Carter Stevenson Regents Chair in the Art of Architecture this spring. I know students are, are super excited. I'm personally excited. I can't wait to see what you produce. And I know we're all looking forward to having you around in the I school. Um, oh, Jing is so co-founder. So Let me mute. Uh, Courtney there. Um, Jing Liu is co-founder and principal with Florian Eidenberg of the office Soil. Founded in 2008, Soil is a practice that hit the ground running with their competition winning entry, pole dance for the MoMA PS1 Young Architects program. As I'm sure you're all aware, PS1 program is one of the rare competitions that offers an architectural practice the opportunity to build research. It is more than an installation. It's not quite a building, but it's somewhere in between the two. Um, it's public, it's a space, but it's also temporary. So it's built research that is thrust into the public realm and immediately put to the test with thousands of active, very sweaty, uh, dancing New Yorkers. So pool dance embraced interactivity and it was absolutely fun. In their work, there's an undeniable balance of seriousness of purpose with the playfulness of life and enjoying it. And sometimes it shows up in little things like the shape of a window in the facade or in the entire form of a project or in the structure of the roof or material like the glass in K-11, or a, the tension of a perforated screen that wraps around a program. And I think of a lot of great buildings, and of course there are many of them in the world, but when you look closely at some of them, it can be hard to find that kind of life that transcends the detail as a technical or a formal innovation and becomes a detail of something more abstract, like an idea. Um, and so Ill's work, that intervention, it feels natural and intentional. Of course, they have expanded exponentially since PS1, completing large civic buildings, landscapes, offices, housing, which I'm sure we'll hear about today. They have won awards, including the AIA New Practices Award, the Emerging Voices Award, the Prix de Rome Miller Prize. Uh, and in 2018, Jing Lu won the Vilcek Prize for Creative Promise in Architecture. Their work has been published widely in everything from A plus U to Domus and uh, the book of their own work, Solid Objectives, Order Edge Aura, which features the first eight years of their office's work. And of course, that's just a small sampling of their achievement and recognition. But there's just one last thing I wanna say before I uh, welcome you, Jing. And that is that we are at a moment in the world and in architecture where we are facing a reckoning and people are demanding change. Some firms have risen to that challenge in a meaningful way, including So Ill. Uh, and just as one example, they're one of the only companies I have seen, including outside of architecture, um, that publishes a diversity, equity, and inclusion report directly on their website. It includes the makeup of the office, including minority, race, and ethnicity, LBGDQ, uh, and gender representation, and furthermore includes a statement on environmental stewardship, indicating goals for their office's impact on the world. Uh, I think by adding this kind of transparency, it makes a clear statement that if you're looking to hire so ill, uh, these conditions are at the core of that relationship, and you know that then as a client, you are going to have to be equally engaged in these issues up front. I think it's really critical and important because it positions architecture as not just a service industry for a client, but a service to a greater community. And it's built on the understanding that when a client puts a building into the world, um, it's just not for them, it's for others. So the evidence of this is in each of their projects, and it's no surprise to me that their project, uh, Amont uh, Amant Art Campus in Brooklyn, uh, just a few weeks ago, hot off the presses, uh, was awarded the Best of Design Project of the Year by Architects Newspaper. Um, so without further ado, please join me in giving a warm virtual welcome to Jing Lu. Thank you so much, um, Corey, for that uh, introduction. And um, 
uh, yeah, we, we don't uh, go back to PS1 that much in the States anymore, but it's a really a foundational project for us in kind of staking a flag on the ground and say what we want to um, do as an architect. And as you mentioned, that from the beginning, we had this very strong belief that what we're doing is not just for ourselves. It's not kind of inward looking practice that we want to make a statement for ourselves. We want to just, uh, you know, be, be uh, answering to the client's immediate desire, but they really, from the beginning, thinking about what are the larger issues and questions at stake. And I think that was very clear from the beginning in PS1. And uh, that project kind of has always reminded us to not forget that no matter what we do. So thank you very much for pointing that out. Um, but I do think that today I'm going to um, go back to some of the early uh, moments and because it's, we started in 2008 and equally that was the formative um, years in the practice of architecture. I think the profession <clears throat> lost one third of the workforce in 2008. Many companies uh, folded during that time and we opened our door at that moment really to think about how do we carry on the project that's still very much needed to continue. Um, but then now we're in 2020, uh, well, 22, but 2020, has also been a very important year for us to, for many of us, you know, all of us to, to rethink about um, what what we do as architects and what we, can we do um, as architects to change the status quo and the trajectory of humanity as a whole. So I think it, it feels in the last two years very productive to, to go back and reflect um, in those early moments. So I will start with with. 2008 in, in today's talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen and assume that all 180 people can see it. If not, let me know. <laughs> okay, so I will start with the past as um, I mentioned as the starting point of um, uh, talking about where the future should be going. And this started this kind of uh, uh, looking back and looking forward as a constant um, feedback loop in our uh, working uh, process that has been there from the beginning. And thanks to actually Mohammed Sharif, who is an um, architecture educator, practitioner, and um, curator who um, invited us to, to do a retrospective in the first year of us opening our practice. Um, and we thought that in the beginning that was a joke, but uh, when we started to talk with him about the idea uh, why he wanted us to do a retrospective, it became very clear that that was exactly um, the intention that, you know, if we're going to start uh, uh, forward thinking, but also um, responsible practice that thinks about the bigger societal questions as a whole, we should really place ourselves 10 years from now and look back at um, the moment from the beginning and uh, positioning ourselves um, in that way. And so that we're really placing our goals um, in the long term and not just the immediate. Um, the immediate um, kind of survival of a practice, so to say. And one of our early projects um, also very much uh, informed our um, thinking in, in that sense that we, we were asked by Arvind Chirmaya, this very, very iconic um, modernist designer to design his uh, weekend home uh, in the early uh, 2008. And uh, he, this project unfortunately did not get realized, but we had a really uh, productive conversation with uh, Ivan throughout the whole process. Ivan's father was um, Sergei Chemayev, who was um, uh, an immigrant um, from Chechnya, um, a Jewish immigrant, and went to London and was very influential in the early modernist movement there. And then Ivan um, was responsible for many of the Chermayev Geisler, his company, uh, was responsible for um, many of the modernist logo uh, graphic design um, in, in America. And so um, Ivan, this house was really the last kind of dream of his life. And <clears throat> Uh, and he came out of a very strong modernist uh, tradition with everything, you know, had to be kind of straight and uh, in a grid and, you know, 
uh, in the graphic design, this kind of underlying rules is very important. Uh, one anecdote was that during Thanksgiving, he called us and said, um, would you, as you will see later in our project, that we like to break the grid. We like to really soften the grid. We like to make it playful from the beginning at the pole dance. We already were trying to make the Cartesian grid very elastic. So in this project, we also introduced a um, softer moment. And then during the Thanksgiving, he call, called us and said, please just get rid of those goddamn curves. And so that was a very um, close, intimate kind of collaboration with, with Ivan. Um, Unfortunately, this project did not get built, um, but we made a short documentary really uh, reflecting on the, the idea of the modern project and um, where it should go from there, because I even lost the money at the, um, in 2008, and that was the reason the project was not, um, this kind of last dream of this life was not realized. Um, so it was a very um, interesting conversation to think about, you know, what do we um, inherit from our ancestors and our predecessors and how can we, what is our role in evolving that project um, forward. And so kind of fast forward to 2020, as I uh, mentioned before, that it's a really reckoning moment for, for many of us, the, the entire world. And we know that there are many um, in this contemporary world, there are many voices, there are many kind of um, timelines of histories and the narratives that are always intersecting with each other. And sometimes it can become very labyrinthian and very complex and that it feels stifling to, to be operating within that. Um, but I think that for us, um, we, we believe, I think Mary Shelley said it once, that innovation does not come out of nothing. It comes out of precisely chaos. So we very much believe that um, this is another moment of very, um, very uh, productive kind of um, creative force. And it is in this complexity that we have to operate in. We cannot be reductive and we have to understand um, this, this complexity and, and move forward with a better intelligence as the architect. And this plan um, is uh, with some of these drawings and the model shots are some of the early studies of our UC Davis project that we completed, I believe, in 2016 in California. And you can see some similarities of um, the kind of softening of the Cartesian grid and the complexity that we're trying to imbue in our project from the planometric to the three-dimensional to the material uh, throughout it. But I think um, in, in this plan, it's a very legible in the sense that, you know, we believe that the human beings and people that when we experience the architecture, uh, we experience with body, we experience with senses, and that's how we think um, in space. Um, that's how we encounter other people. That's how we encounter objects in space. And those knowledges have to, um, be be absorbed um, through this sensorial and the bodily in a kinesthetic way. And uh, um, we have to make the rooms relate to the another rooms in, in a way that's surprising, that's serendipitous, that's joyful, and it should not be repetitive, and it cannot just be a uh, um, that that's that's the language of the machine, the, the straight lines that just continue um, forever. That's the language of the machine. That's not the language of the biology, and we have to. Um, and that's not also the language of culture. Um, so we believe that um, architecture has to, um, you know, try to. Uh, imbue that complexity within the space of itself. And by that, I think at every scales and at every levels, the material, spatial, and the programmatic, um, surprising and more joyful moment can come out. For example, in UC Davis, uh, many artists started to do very, very interesting um, site installations because of the kind of um, the spatial interests that um, they find in there. We had uh, Louisa Lumpley, the um, amazing photographer who um, documented the shadow um, that moves through this great canopy that we call it, grand canopy that covered the entire museum's site. Um, and the, the, during the day when the light moves through the, <clears throat> through the canopy, it creates this pattern that's 
ever-changing and it's dynamic that overlaps with the pattern of the precast concrete. So the vertical and the horizontal and the, the um, more permanent and the more transient forces start to play off each other. And it's those moments that we find very um, important to, to imbue in the architecture we make. And at the end of the day, those are the things that are not abstract. Those are the things that we have to think about what are the tenants and what are the tools that we as architecture, uh, we as architects have in, in, in order to, uh, to achieve those experiences. So in our first book um, that came out in uh, five, six years by now, uh, we, we but it, it's a it consists of two titles. One is Solid Objectives, which is a kind of um, a birth cry of our office that we want to solidify objectives and we want to solidify and um, concepts and um, uh, these larger questions and the answers in built form and in matters. Um, that's, so that's really the reason that we, we started our own practice, but also the tenants of the architecture that we work with. Order talks about the underlying um, order and the kind of organizations of, of space we create. The edge talks about its relationship with its surroundings and with the others. This uh, an area of mediation, an area of exchange. And the aura talks uh, maybe more about the formal expressions, but also the material um, engagement that one would have with, with, with architecture. Um, <clears throat> so the first uh, topic of the order, I think uh, um, we talked already about this, that the pole dance was uh, one of the first projects that we started to explore that. So here, you, what you see in, in PS1 courtyard, which is a very rectangular space that is very ubiquitous in architecture, that we um, uh, broke it down to our uh, Cartesian grid um, uh, scale or layout, but those grids are not made out of uh, immutable um, static columns. They're made with this very soft poles that, um, that by themselves don't stand up at all. So the only way that they actually um, uh, don't flop onto the ground is that they're connected with each, each other. So it's the connections that make them stand up. But it's all the connections are made out of bungee cords. And so there's like elasticity in that connection as well. So this Cartesian grid is playful. It's never perfect. Um, it's engaging. You know, we had a lot of um, collaboration with uh, uh, with um, other disciplines during this uh, summer months. That um, you know, this is this is a picture of the American Championship of Pole Dance that called us and said, "You called your installation pole dance, so we want to do a pole dance um, performance in it." So um, it was quite amazing that they were able to climb onto this pole so that also dances with them. But that was uh, very much the intention that the space should be. In engaging and should be responsive and should be uh, behaving in as kinesthetic way as uh, we are uh, our bodies. And not then, of course, um, in every project so that we can make things melt, so we can make things elastic, we can make things fall, fall apart. So how do we do that with, with projects that need to be more, um, uh, let's say, uh, unmovable? Um, this is a proposal we <clears throat> uh, made for a, a museum project in, in um, Belgium, and it's actually a continuation, so it's a renovation and um, extension project, so half of this project, I mean this model, the left half is um, new and the right half is old, but we reorganized the um, walls in the old part of the museum and then extend that uh, kind of organization to, to create the new edition. But as you can see, maybe in the, in the way light is um, shining through the model that the uh, openings in this grid is not repetitive, like it's not unfilled, it's all corner openings. And by doing so, 
your your trajectory of moving through the museum can be almost like Rubik's cubes. There's infinite amount number of ways that you can um, encounter the objects and the, the artwork and the programs in the museum. We don't differentiate in uh, differentiate the back of house or the front of house or the storage versus you know, public spaces. They are all part of this kind of fluid and uh, um, system of space that you're always uh, working diagonally and every moment and when you're at the cross you're presented with multiple choices and you might come back to the same place that um, from another angle um, and some space you might never go to and some spaces you might come back to you know three or four times now I understand that probably if the project was any bigger, it might be confusing, but at this scale, it was a very exploratory and experimental um, way of thinking about how exhibitions and how space and how stories can be told um, in this kind of organization. Um, we, we did not win that competition, but we were able to apply the similar pro uh, kind of concept in this exhibition design in 2017 in Amsterdam. And it was an exhibition for, <clears throat> for a private collector that um, collected art throughout their whole life. And um, each room represented the relationship with a single artist. Um, again, so that this idea of kind of really getting to know both the conversations that the artist had with the collector, but also the collector's own um, I would say like a development and a kind of growth and uh, evol evolution as a as a collectors throughout the time and then kind of revisiting certain moments um, in your earlier life was uh, really the result of this way of presenting that collection and throughout also the entire um, I think it was five months of the um, exhibition. The, some rooms will be changed once in a while so that you're never encountering the show in the same way as how our memories work as well, that we are remembering things um, every time slightly different. And that's because our experience of the present reframes the way we're looking at our past and the way we're projecting forward as well. Um, so, and also within those, the system of space, we're able to create spaces that are deeper. So, you know, um, that there could be space that are uh, darker and spaces that are brighter. So when you're encountering a dark space from a bright space, it, the depth of the space becomes infinitely expanding. And then um, similarly, we, we um, also expand that thinking to the programmatic. This is a proposal for another um, culture project in, in um, uh, Holland that we uh, juxtapose the project uh, programs that are dark spaces, so more kind of performance and the um, multimedia programs so with uh, programs that are uh, more kind of uh, open to a more kind of white box and showing uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional artwork and then mixing that in the middle so that the middle space really becomes this place that's somewhere ambiguous it's it's not part of the multimedia program and it's not part of the um, uh, exhibition program so this is actually two organizations that are coming together um, and, and that we were really trying to think about what are the ways that they can operate independently, but also influence each other in, in a very creative and open-ended way. And then, so those, uh, the order speaks a lot about the interior and it speaks a lot about the, the spatial organization on the inside. Um, <clears throat> but if the order and the organization um, it, it extends out and radiates out and it inevitably will come to an edge and that edge can be a section or just a cut of of the grid of the plan of um, the internal kind of demand the internal motivation but it, it should also be remain flexible at the edge it's because there are the, there are other forces and there are the cultures and there are other uh, uh, lives that are out um, in the context that um, any kind of internal demand needs to also negotiate and project outwards and have a dialogue and conversation with. So that edge becomes also one of the most interesting um, places 
for us to explore as, a, as an architect. And sometimes that edge can be very thick that allows you to kind of look across at the poche space, or sometimes that is, is a very um, large word. It, it almost becomes its own space that, for example, in, in the Japanese and uh, uh, traditional or uh, architecture that you have the space of the ma, which is literally the unit of the space, and then you have often this uh, um, garden that is not really nature, it's a, more of a representation of an utopian or reflective moment, the inner world, uh, the inside of, of the human imagination, and it's that space of the ma and the space of the imagination and the possibilities and the connection to something larger than ourself, that in between space become a place that um, you can look outwards into that inward looking space, but also looking back at um, the everyday and the more orderly um, space. And that in Gawa, it's called, is really the space of the edge becomes um, an architectural feature in itself. So <clears throat> one of our, again, quite early project in 2012 that we uh, completed was the Kuche Gallery. Um, that really talks about this um, thinking very, very well. Um, so diagrammatically, we were we were asked by the client who is a contemporary art um, gallery in in Korea, and then they were doing the third um, gallery buildings for for their um, operations, and then they wanted to the first and second buildings were very um, convoluted in terms of the plan, so they the only programmatic requisite is to make the largest. Um, gallery box without any columns on this very, very tight and very constrained site, which is right across the street from, from uh, uh, in the Imperial Palace in Seoul. Um, so there's a lot of uh, hundreds of years old uh, honeycombs that have this courtyard um, typologies and they're all made out of um, clays and wood and elevated. So the context is very sensitive and very historical. And we thought that the diagram of this very big contemporary art scaled um, box was too um, overbearing for, for that sensitive um, context. So what we did it was to actually to push all the accessory programs outside of that box so that they, they start to kind of have that movement outside of this very abstract space. And then we enveloped the whole thing with this cloak, um, let's say the clothes, um, something that that's kind of elastic and that's more fabric like. And so, but you know, Korea, like many Asian countries, we get a, um, we get a lot of uh, very big um, typhoons. So all the exterior um, building cladding would have to really clear a really stringent uh, wind load um, requirement. So we uh, were wondering from the beginning how we're we going to make this close for, for a building at this scale. Um, so we went to, um, we went to, um, maybe, maybe we'll skip that and then I will explain that story a bit more um, because this relates to the third topic that um, I mentioned it's the aura and then the aura um, uh, you know it's it, we debated quite a long time in the office it's almost like a year and a half that what what should we call this is this about the representation or is it about beauty or is it about um, um, is it about presence? You know, like what is it that we're trying to say? And then we thought that in the end we ended up with the aura because aura can doesn't have to be beautiful or uncanny. It can be any of those things. Um, but it's also not just a representation from the inside. There, there is also the receiver end at play here that plays a very important role for for the aura because of how you see something defines the aura of that, um, that uh, object as well. And um, but this other very in, in important kind of reference for us is this um, blind man and the elephant um, fable that's um, material or kind of sculpted in this little object. Um, that the fable basically um, is about that there are seven blind men that touches this elephant, which is um, you know, symbol um, symbolizes something much larger than ourselves, 
and everyone's touching different parts of the body of the elephant and they converse with each other. And in everyone's head, the elephant might look different, but somehow when you stitch this seven stories, there's something quite um, also specific that emerges. And that specificity is very much informed by um, the body, the interaction with that, uh, with that thing as well. And in, in that line of thoughts, uh, we, um, Floyd and I are both um, immigrants and to, to this country. I'm from China and Florian from US. And uh, we, it's Chimaya, who was also from, from um, Europe. So we, we work often with people coming, we're leaving, we have left, we're, you know, um, being drawn and um, brought to another place. And I think that a common thread between um, people who have taken those kind of choices in life is this really belief that we are as a human beings, no matter if you are um, doing something very different from me or grew up in a very different context, that there's something uh, fundamental that binds us all together. And I think if when we are talking about the practice of architecture, and especially when we are getting on the site and really getting to the building culture, um, the, uh, the heritage, and getting to work with people on the site and working with people who are from those areas or maybe sometimes not from that areas that are trying to kind of make a life there, then the, the this very abstract ideas that we're talking about, like the beauty and the aura and the uncanny or the sublime or the water or the Cartesian, all of this have to come down to the ground and have to materialize. And that's why we call it our op office solid objectives. And you know, this, this, someone that we find uh, quite a um, strong affinity with is uh, Lina Bobardi, for example, moving from from Italy to um, to Brazil, and then um, uh, at the cusp of thinking about what that country's modern um, uh, modern uh, period or modern era would look like architecturally, and the thinking we're collaborating a lot both in the arts and in the societies uh, with all layers of uh, of societies, and working very very closely with the hands of the people and. Uh, embracing the crafts of that place and but still making something that really speaks to a larger audience um, on the international scale as well as to some of them, someone that we find quite um, affinity with. So going back to the Kuche Gallery's uh, <coughs> cloth, and the, the um, clothes, so to say, our inspiration came out of uh, really a trip to the Met um, Museum where um, with our kids that we saw this armor and they thought this is the answer that you have this very robust uh, material that is not soft and it can withstand the building um, tension. Um, that's required here, but um, because of the way they're connected to each other, so again, it's the connection and the interaction of between the unit and between the atom that's at play here, that allows it to be elastic and allows it to take on all kinds of um, characteristics of the body. So um, we thought, okay, this is the answer rather than kind of uh, digitally, you know, figuring out what this shape is and then um, in the computer, making it into panels and uh, making it faceted, um, uh, uh, you know, pixels. That this is the this is the material that actually the behavior that we're looking for. So we translated that in the computer and understood the kind of how the chain chain link would work. But still, at the end of the day, you have to make that, and uh, no one. Um, you know, it doesn't exist on the market. It's not a specifiable pro product. Um, in at, at the architecture scale, yes, at the kind of um, there are a lot of uh, pole dance um, or belly dance costumes that are made that are machine made, but they're much smaller um, and they're also butt jointed. So there's no way that it can withstand the tension that we're looking for. So we went to really this uh, kind of mother. Uh, 
land of uh, all things wire mesh in the middle of China, uh, where this city has 2,000 uh, workshops that only do uh, stainless steel, aluminum, all kinds of alloys um, welding and for both the oil, oil refinery uh, industries at one, one scale, but the, um, in, the, in another extreme, on the other extreme, like a kitchen utensils and things like that. So we worked with the workshops, a um, few of them, and got them all together to, to devise this process of hand welding uh, 500,000 rings together and they did mock-ups in um, the local Local, uh, the backyard of the local public schools, and um, eventually, um, with them together, we were able to make this uh, clothes for for this building that really softened it and it made it more reactive and sensitive to this very um, historical context. And this is a, a project that um, maybe you know we cannot clog every project with with a uh, something that's handmade and something that's rain. So there are uh, other ways, um, obviously, in different contexts that you can achieve that. This project that we just recently completed in Brooklyn in a um, mount is in um, the Bushwick neighborhood in Brooklyn, which is a very industrial um, area that has a lot of artists, but also just the warehouses. And it's next to one of the most polluted waterway in, in New York. So it's always been a little bit of the backwater, but in recent years, it has um, uh, become really the hub where a lot of artists are um, moving into and having their studios um, there. So the project, again, it's um, arts campus so it, it houses both exhibition space as well as artist residencies um, and performance space it's, that context is as you see here on the left is very rough um, it's uh, many buildings were built about 100 years ago and they're dilapidated they're built out of mostly cmu blocks or um, brick or some are kind of um, um, metal a lot of metal sidings and a lot of rust and so those are the really the inherited material and the language that we had in the neighborhood so from the beginning we knew that we wanted to um uh, really respect and not to blend in so to say but to respect and to work with that context and that and that material kind of um, idiosyncrasy of that neighborhood so we did the, a series this is a mock early mock-up you you see here that we kind of had a, a a collection of the palette of the materials over that we thought would be first uh, we are able to work with a kind of locally readily available laborers to, to achieve something nice um, but also the materials that we could find easily um, at least within the family in the neighborhood so brick um, concrete uh, unistrat you know galvanized the metal and, and, and those kind of familiar uh, materials but kind of really mocking them up and see in what ways they can speak to each other, in what ways they can um, project a different kind of aura, as, uh, uh, if you will, to, to the uh, public life. So a um, few things that we did here, this is a kind of a nod to Nina Bobardi that there is a part of the three buildings here. One is a renovation and two are new build and one of the new build is a performance space and the artist residents are in here. So in this concrete volume, um, we were very keen on making the uh, presence of the hands concrete. Um, we, we tend to think of it as a very infrastructural, big, um, you know, permanent thing, but it's actually a very hand uh, crafted material because before you pour the concrete, you make the formwork uh, often by wood, but nowadays um, there are all this more kind of standardized formwork. But here we, we made it formwork um, mostly by hand by wood. And so it's more of a carpentry and, uh, and the dialogue was something that's very, very heavy, but also very liquidy and hard to control. If you have a crack, they can leak and then they everything can burst at the seam. So it's a very, um, you have to really kind of understand the behavior of the material you're working with. And um, it's almost like a cooking that you cannot, you know, if you just leave the fire a little bit too too much and too high, you're going to burn your food. So 
Um, so we wanted to just kind of make sure that the hands of the people and some of this more, um, uh, you know, like human aspect can come through even in a material like this that tend to be very industrial. And then also, um, this is a, just a, a quite common gypsum um, brick, and we uh, used the brick in, in a different way. Um, the course is uh, kind of 45 degree rotated that allows the brick to actually wrap around the corner without any seams. So the, the corner brick is just one of the, the rotations and then it makes the entire building much softer. So then it gives the depth in the building in this way, but also um, you know the, the, the edge is not a 90 degree like this sharp line anymore and then so every in every one of those three buildings we have two materials or two textures of the same material in the concrete sense in the, in the case of the concrete um and so here this is a uh just aluminum um a more anodized aluminum at the top to really reflect the um, sky, but also the other murals across the street and, and animate the light qualities around um, the building itself. And this two layered uh, material is also a way to negotiate many of the contextual buildings, the buildings on site that has a datum at, at the one story uh, level datums and our buildings are a little bit taller than that in many cases. And there's also the datum of the storefront that on this side, um, this the building actually has uh, two spans, the entire two boxes. So on this block, on this street, there are many shops um, as well. So there's a storefront um, data that we were trying to carry carry through, even though this is not a shop, a retail building. And what you also see here is the concrete floor that we uh, made this custom breaking um, pattern so that we, we worked with the people who are pouring the concrete to, um, to kind of improvise and dance with this rake so that the breaking marks are very visible as you're coming into the gallery, but also all the public space of the galleries that have this kind of hand uh, imprinted in, in the something that's more permanent. <clears throat> and within the buildings are, we were very, um, maybe you remember in the beginning, the, in the model that we were very interested also in bringing the public as deep as possible into the block. So there's not much um, you know, other activities around the neighborhood, um, but it, there is a really active and very vibrant artistic kind of social scenes. So the idea is uh, really to kind of put place some of this more active programs like the performance space and the cafes and the bookstores deep into the block and then open the building up to the street with alleyways with um, uh, on, on the two sides so that uh, the public can come deep into into the buildings and then find some place like this that um, that has green that has protections and it's a place to really um, hang out and, and be social. So those are the kind of tenancy, like let's say the tenants of the architecture that we work with and um, thinking about the, the organizational, um, the edge conditions and the context um, very carefully, but also the material and how we make them, who do we make them and how do we honor the hands of the people who, who make them um, through, through these uh, uh, processes. Um, because of this semester, I am, uh, teaching the studio about the housing and the houses um, and the green core and really thinking about the house's the role in, uh, in the climate, you know, in, in the context of climate change, in the context of social health, um, public health um, uh, in, in our, you know, into this world and to, I thought that maybe I'll highlight a few projects that, that um, are thinking about the, the domestic realm. Most of the projects that we saw till now are working with the arts and working with institutional clients. Um, and these are on the other side of the spectrum and really thinking about the individual and our relationship with each other. 
Um, so from the beginning, we uh, have been interested in the topic of the house and the housing. Um, both Florian and I grew up in collective house housing, um, you know, with, with other peoples and um, a very strong kind of uh, um, idea that the house um, is really uh, not a private property, but it's a, it's a place that you, you um, negotiate, connect, and um, uh, exercise uh, what kind of relationship that we want to have with ourselves and with, with the others. So we've done, um, we've tried to do houses or housing from the beginning, but not very successfully for many reasons. And it's only recently that we started to build um, domestic programs. Um, but we have been experimenting from the beginning, and I would like to share with you some of those experimentations in the beginning first, and then how that translates to some of the current projects that we are um, able to implement. Um, but before that, uh, maybe just to kind of reflect a little bit of how we're thinking, how uh, we're reading the history of homes and housing and houses uh, from the primitive hut, so to say, that we are, uh, that that is not that much, I would say like distance from the caves or the bird's nest, so to say, like there's this innate desire for, and, and necessity for uh, all creatures to find places of safety and places where we can protect ourselves and find comfort and, um, and to uh, take care of our families and our offsprings. And, but I think at this, today's age, the house, when we're thinking about housing market, when we're thinking about you know, stock market and, all, and, and the disasters and insurance and all of those things, so that the house has become so, we have become so in, um, and estranged from, from this uh, core, um, more kind of biological need of uh, having the place of safety and the kind of primitive hut, um, and uh, to really use that site as a negotiation with our relationship with context. So we have used that house and uh, as, as a place to really collect our object and personal you know, um, wealth and um, uh, you know, like basically all kinds of material belongings and and it really um, uh, has become something entirely different and, and often it's a speculative um, agent as well in, in kind of uh, amassing even more wealth and to be traded on the market. Um, and then there's an anecdote that you know in in before actually the Dutch and golden age that most of the domestic spaces were not called in many cultures were not called a house now, although house is the way we call home in most of the developing world uh, developed world now in Chinese we call it, um, uh, like where you live a wu which uh, has more relationship with the the ceiling, I'm not ceiling the roof. So it's a it's a plane that you negotiate and that's under something that negotiate and mediate with the sky and the element um, above. Um, in French, uh, they call it maison, which is about a place to remain. And um, and in in Italy, in it Italian, it's called um, uh, the, big, the, the many terms of being in Italian for, for the house, but for, or for the home, but often they're also related to, to um, how uh, th how the members are related to each other. So I think the house is a in kind of language linguistic terms. It it came out of this German language, the Hus, and it was really a place where you stored grains and stored animals and livestock. So it's not really a place where human beings lived. It's also not an active program. It's a place that's more passive. And that's why um, there's the typology of the house, uh, the boxes, and they're connected with this very utilitarian um, circulation. So that made us really start to think about like why do we accept this kind of corridor and the boxes that have only one doors, um, you know, in and out from the corridor, 
um, as to the way um, that we have to accept the housing. And then why is that the way? Because, um, you know, because that um, does not produce a sense of joy and does not produce a complexity and it does not produce it a kinesthetic kind of experience that we spend the most of the time in 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 um in our lives right so um but if we look at the, the kind of even just recent history there has been a lot of people um a lot of architects who have challenged those notions um, and we we were collaborating with the Design Museum um, in London on an exhibition in 2000, um, I think it was 2018, called the Home Futures. And many of these projects were were part of that exhibition as well. And um, there's a, here you see a few of them that uh, really informed our thinking about the domestic space. For example, the Kazuo Ishinohana's uh, house for a poet um, that basically um, has an old dirt floor. It's a, it's a big space that has no uh, further sub subdivisions. It's built on a hill and the entire floor is just following the topography of the mountains and the entire floor is dirt. So you're in that space and very much connected to both the, the material and the form and the dimensions of the surroundings. And um, the, the the project below um, that on the right is called Co-op and it's a, a kind of stage and photography by Hans Mayer in uh, 1926 that was very much kind of trying to talk about um, a new world order that it's we, we are uh, going into this kind of modernist era and it's you know the, even the house has to be socially oriented and we have to think we, we should think about you know not superfluous um, uh, you know life but to really think about the essence uh, of life and that's very much just spoken um, to by by in this image and also Ugo Lampleta who is this designer in um, from, um, from Italy who did this series of almost performance art that's called The Living is Being at Home Everywhere, that he would design a series of kind of almost furniture, domestic um, space, um, occupation, um, like street occupation, you know, um, space agent, so to say, that he would, this one is a, is a bed, but it's also easel that he can just kind of bring and the will around and the deploy in the middle of a public space. And to, this is also a way for him to talk about that we need to reclaim the, the um, public and the, the collective, um, you know, really to reclaim that for the individual. And we cannot forget the importance of the individual's role in, in this top-down kind of uh, system um, and, and also allow everyone to be very idiosyncratic and um, absurd in, in a certain sense. And then there's also a lot of, um, uh, project that it dealt with the women's role in society, but also in the space, in the domestic space, in the space of production. How do we um, design the kitchen more efficient so that the, the Victorian women, um, you know, transitioning to the kind of the modern women, don't have to be um, bogged down by uh, you know all this domestic chores. And um, that's uh, the picture you see at the bottom, and then the picture you see at the top is this Toyota. To Pau, but you see Sejima, who's, a, um, who's an architect that um, both Floyd and I, and I worked for. Um, <clears throat> and then the installation is called the, the Dwelling for Tokyo Nomad Women. And in the this kind of bubble of Japan in the 1980s, where women start to have jobs and have they don't have to depend on anyone anymore and they can be deployed and they were exploring the cities on their own and it'd be very um very uh um not tied down and free in that sense, very nomadic in that sense that this kind of minimal living structure that only um is responding to the need of that individual woman. And then this project on the left is by this uh, Lithuanian artist um, who moved to the US uh, before the war. 
and she uh, made basically her uh, townhouse, this very boxy and rectangular um, townhouse in, in Manhattan um, into this very soft and very sensual environment through um, fabric. And um, the story goes that one day that she woke up in the middle of the night and just thought, look at the ceiling and thought that, why am I living in a space that are, you know, uh, with the 90 degree angles and everything is so constrained and it doesn't feel right. And I don't want to see the right angles and don't want to be living in the box. So she started to kind of cut um, fabrics and start to um, uh, work with this more kind of tensile forces of the fabric to create space that are very um, elastic and very um, sensuous and very um, um, translucent in that sense. So one of the other first project in which we started to think about, um, and in a smaller scale to think about at the fundamental um, level, if we're thinking about that this kind of primitive hut and this kind of um, the first layer of space that we envelop ourselves from the other environment, you know, the, the, uh, the environment and the outside. Um, is, a, is this kind of a minimal veil and the kind of embryo, so to say. And um, in 2020, that we all know that the mask is also an architecture. And we started to wear this like um, uh, really big kind of apparatus around our head that we can even call that the architecture. architecture. And it's these layers that kind of negotiate um, between the me and the um, the others, right, and the, the environment around. So this project, it's definitely not 2020, it's a 20, it's like three, four years before the pandemic that we we did an installation in the collaboration with the artist Anna Povacci at the Chicago Biennial, very much talked about um, that relationship. If the air and the environment is to and degrading and the air quality is getting worse in our kind of rapidly urbanizing and extractive environment, then do we have to all be uh, enclosed within our own bubbles? And how can that bubble, um, you know, be uh, breathable and to be filtering, but still project, you know, our personalities out and still project a certain kind of humanness and em empathy outwards. So we looked at, um, uh, we were collaborating also with a, a, a group of uh, musicians that had uh, all wind instruments. So they would be, the, the whole piece is a performance piece that each of the musicians would be in this costume that's made out of air filtering uh, uh, fabric and they would um, be playing the music with the wind instrument which moves a lot and it's really big so we uh, looked at the scan and looked at the way that they move and each of the bodies sizes and then made a custom made costumes for them so each of these shapes is really kind of coming out of the characteristics and the instruments they play. And so in Chicago Biennial, um, there's this uh, series of events and performances that these uh, musicians were performing, for performing in them. <clears throat> and then um, later we uh, carried the, the same thought and kind of worked on the bigger scale installations at the, the uh, Minano um, Salone in Italy. And it's a, a basically a kind of minimal footprint domestic kind of structure that also uses this time not just air filtering, you know, air conditioning filtering cloths, but it is slightly more advanced and more technical and experimental um, material that's developed by this Japanese company that basically collects the pollution and the filtering them um, from the air. And then when the rain comes, it would just wash itself. So it becomes also a cleansing machine. Um, the, the house becomes a cleansing machine itself. And um, inside it, there's no furniture. So we're just rethinking the floor so that the floor becomes a, a space, place that you can live and you can read and you can relax. Um, this is highly um, experimental and highly, uh, it's not even a prototype. I think that the way uh, this project is really trying to tackle is a, this similar thing um, that we were 
trying to tackle in the Chicago project is that what is the, you know, our relationship with, with the context that we're going into and how do we um, materially express um, our exchange with the environment and, you know, can our, that exchange not to be just um, shutting everything out, nor is it just about, um, uh, you know, uh, pumping pollutions out, but maybe that exchange is something more equitable and is more productive in the long run. So um, this project was uh, um, nested into a very dense old uh, neighborhood in Milan, and that made us really interested also in thinking about that not as an object, um, but also as an object within the building itself. So this is a project that's under construction. We're opening in next um, month. It's a condo project in Brooklyn that um, encompasses, I think, about 18 units of uh, two to three bedroom um, house in a very residential and family driven neighborhood in Brooklyn. So um, the zoning, but also the, the fabric of the neighborhood necessitate a quite um, closed building and then the, the, the volume really lines to the edge of the sidewalk. But then within the building itself, um, we were very adamant. Um, this is our first residential building in New York or in America because we, from the beginning had been always saying to any you know, client that wanted to hire us that we want to change the way the housing plans are done in, in at least in New York City and in many other places as well that we don't want to do a double of the corridor which is the most efficient um, in terms of kind of um, usable or sellable square footage versus the non-sellable square footage. But that really makes the corridor a dreadful space and that makes basically every unit to have only one direction towards the outside. So we said that, you know, we always wanted to do something that has the public circulation that's on the uh, exterior. So it's, it's, a, um, unco it's covered, but it's not enclosed. And that allows also a building like this to have three, every unit to have three exposures. So you would be able to look into the atrium and space, which is also a public circulation space, but also three, you know, other directions. So while you're inside that house, you're very much connected with the outside and you see the sunlight um, coming from one side of the unit and leaving to on the other side of your house and you you're not static and enclosed in that kind of box like space so that's what you see here in the individual i think we're missing the, the side photo it's almost completed so this project um, strikes a much but not much a slightly lower ratio of what is sellable versus uh, what is built um, but it has a become like one of the um, uh, exemplary project in New York and even New York Times had it in their kind of uh, real estate section as the exemplary project for post pandemic housing that we have the right to have access to fresh air, to have the right to have public space within our private and domestic space to be humane and to be connected with our neighbors and to have a space to, to have a conversation at the end of the day. Um, and to also looking into each other's window and you know not be afraid of that that um, you get to know other people's life and in uh, mexico we had a similar um, typology implemented or built a few years ago um, with a very different set of um, much larger um, um, tasks at hand so this is a project it's called um, las americas and we worked with um, with uh, the city of Lyon to implement a series, uh, a prototypical housing project that will reverse what you see on the screen here, which is the urban sprawl um, that uh, is, uh, is the result of um, very cheap leap and a, like um, unthought of rollout of uh, assisted housing, uh, not assisted housing, uh, affordable housing. Um, in, in Mexico in the last 20 years um, because of the industrialization in the country and especially in Lyon, which is a very industrialized city, that the population has grown like 
10 times and all this population had to be accommodated and somewhere. So from the kind of government level, in front of it is a kind of a betting map of, the, of uh, Mexico that they just roll out of this uh, this uh, loan and the, the developers just take them and make this cookie cutter very you know simply built houses um, outside of the city and then they go on and on and on sometimes it takes three hours to get into the city to to where you work from those places and it's completely unsustainable it uh, converts the uh, natural land or agricultural land to, to housing um, and in this very low dense way so it's not very efficiently used um, and there's no social infrastructure nor um, you know just basic infrastructures like trash pickups or public transportations or hospitals or um, uh, schools. Um, so that is something that um, has become a very, even this, every layers of the society realize that this is problematic. So um, we were given by um, the, the city the task of really being the outsider and being the one that kind of generates enough, enough um, enthusiasm within the city to um, to densify the inner cities itself so that we can move people, they can move people back into the city. But because most people are not used to living in the high rise or even mid rise, that we need to make the project into something that's attractive and that's um, that's exciting enough that it becomes, uh, it reverses the trend of the sprawl. So we did a series of workshops with uh, politicians and, um, you know, bureau, like kind of housing bureaus there. And we were kind of also, again, showing them that how the double loaded corridor, which is such a, um, you know, given um, often not questioned enough um, typologies that doesn't produce a very, good kind of um, domestic experience, but also relationship on the kind of neighborhood level and how we can achieve the same, same amount of unit with a single load of the corridor and with a very uh, good courtyard in the middle for the residents. So this is uh, this building is a 60, um, 68 units in there and it's broken into, because of this maybe strip configurations that they have two courtyard, one that's a little bit larger, one the building mass is a little bit higher and one's a, um, a little bit smaller courtyard. And, um, and the entire building was made out, also had to be completely affordable. And it's for people who make less than $7,000 a year that can apply for this housing programs. Um, and so the entire building had to be made under $2 million, um, but we didn't want to sacrifice really the, the, uh, the building still need to look exciting and um, with dignity and in integrity and it should be a place that you want to actually move um, back to the city and, and be here. So in the beginning, we thought that it would make this very playful precast panels that can have uh, different orientations along the facade and the catches light in a different way um, so that it animates this building that um, is, some, is something that the city has never seen, such a large scale um, build, housing building. But then we started to do uh, mock-ups with um, precast company. This was at the moment that the war between uh, the wall between Mexico and, and uh, America was getting erected. So we thought that, um, you know, they must have a lot of company that do precast concrete, but we, we can contact a lot of them and we started to do mock-ups and um, all of them were really big failures. And also we realized that the oldest precast companies were not local. They were at least, you know, um, uh, a few hours away in the different municipalities. So in the end, we came up with this um, solution, which is to make a local uh, CMU blocks, um, a very custom shaped CMU blocks that has five faces. And because they have uh, different, um, faces and you can rotate them so that when they are put together, they created the same kind of very animated and playful um, exterior um, expressions and catches light in a, in a more animated way. And each of this block is designed to, to uh, be carried by one person. So we didn't have to hire an outside 
um, outside company and you know to precast all of this and then bring it in and then just hand it with with non-local labor because you need a crane to hand precast panels. So a CMU block kind of construction method was allowing us also to hire local um, local labors um, in this project. So here you see an example of how it's deployed and to create the window frames at different angles as well. Um, this is a kind of close up of how, how that brick um, works out. And this is a, a, a neighborhood that has already a very vibrant um, street life. There's a market there. So to, to kind of drop something in this very vibrant and very lively neighborhood, we really wanted to be quite sensitive to, to its role as this backdrop and then not to um, not to overwhelm it or kill it, that kind of life, and to and further animating it and and, uh, and uh, um, kind of amplify its energy. Um, so that's the building um, from different uh, elevations and the different entries. And um, also at night, this was before the moving, so it's a bit dark, but as you can imagine that when people moving, these windows would admit light from inside to the outside in a very also playful way as well. And in, in the kind of aerial view, you can start to see that how this building's scale is very different from the rest of the city. And it's really the only residential buildings that takes on this, this scale. So, sorry, I have to move this out of the way so you can see it. Um, and and it, it was very important that we took care of the material expressions um, and aura of, of the building. That's the end of my talk. Thank you so much, Jing. That was an amazing lecture. Um, I think we're close on time, but if you if you're willing to take one or two questions, uh, are you willing to? Yes. Okay. If anyone has questions, also I'll, I'll watch online on YouTube. There's quite a few people watching on YouTube, so if you're on YouTube and want to ask a question, I can read it. Um, otherwise, go ahead and raise your hand and ask it here. I can ask questions. Go for it. Hi, I'm Charlie Jean. Hi. Thanks, thanks for the lecture. Great lecture. Uh, it's good to know about like the how the development of the firm a little bit. My my question is about all of your project have that playfulness in it. It's kind of novelty in it a little bit, but it's also very grounded. So it's my question is like when me and our student in school when we develop a project in the beginning, we have all this crazy idea and we try to all fit together into a project kind of coherently and we don't know how they work. But in, in your project, it's kind of, in your, in your design development, how do you keep yourself grounded when you have several ideas? How do you decide which one is the fairly one to kind of pursue more? Is it from experience or do you always go back to like the detail, how does it come together? Like, can you talk a little bit about that? Mm, I mean, we we work a lot with hands from the beginning. So at the urban scale, at the formal scale, we already start to make a, a lot of massing models. And maybe um, you can see that, you know, like the, the Kujim, for example, it didn't come out of, uh, you know, the first try, right? Like there, there are a lot of models that's made about pushing different volumes out of the box or, you know, in, in the UC Davis, I would say that we made many, many models where the line can go in many different ways. And so I think from the beginning, this idea of kind of learning as you're doing it is very important. Um, it's not like it only till the end that we do the mock-up and then think about the materials. It's in the beginning already kind of getting our own hands to be very close to the space and the form that we're making. So that, that's maybe one thing that, um, that helps us to also be more intelligent with which form is the right thing to place in that context. Because I find it very difficult when, um, you know, I think it's students and young people these days tend to live in the in a computer way too much because the computer is a tunnel vision. Like you never see the things in so many different 
um, distances, right? Like you, you do, with a model, you can get close to the model, you can come out of the model, you can look at this way and that way. The way we're seeing space and the way we we'll move around the building, um, you know, it's not an episodic, it's all those things kind of stitched together in our head and we cognitively, you know, walk around the building through time. So I, I think for us, the, the working with hands from the beginning, from the diagrammatic to the end, you know, to the, to the material is very important. And then maybe that's how I think as a design process grounds us. Cool. Thank you. Danny, I see your hand raised. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I love the lecture. And I was just gonna say one thing that stood out to me in specific that I really loved was how um, you were talking about the mission of using housing and um, creating a different type of housing that was more ethical and was more human-based and driven by profit. Um, I was wondering uh, like what your process is when you're trying to like um, balance that practicality and ethical impact. Um, Cause I know a lot of times uh, I guess these you hear like these projects are bound by the constraints of you know budget and um practicality so I was just a little bit more curious about um you know how you balance trying to solve those uh social issues in the design process yeah I mean it's a great question because I think um um, as architects, um, the innovation does not happen only in the studios. It happens in the factories. It happens with the city agencies. It happens with the client that pays for it, with culture, with the users. So I, I, you can only push as far as other people are willing to go together with you, right? Like in any of these materials, um, some, some projects that we do have really um, quite ambitious kind of material experimentations, um, but we can only go as far as, um, you know, the makers, the glass makers, or the, the welders, or the bricklayers are willing to go together with you. So I think that um, to recognize that and to be humble about it, and to also kind of collaborate, you know, and every aspect of the building is what the building process, the design process is something that we, uh, we collaborate with a lot, with many people a lot. We collaborate with mathematicians sometimes to think about how we can think about material efficiencies and spatial efficiencies so that we can tell the clients that, look, um, you know, yes, this is the matrix that you might uh, that might not be conventional and that might be a little bit different. And this is the other ways that you can actually um, make a bigger gains and, and a different, in a different aspect or in different um, ways. So I think that to just uh, educate ourselves and then to, to prove that your intuition is right, that this is the right thing to do through so many, many, you know, um, uh, do, do your due diligence. And it's, it's the only way I, I find to be able to convince other people. Thank you. Uh, Corinne. Hello, oh, thank you so much for an amazing lecture. And uh, it was really wonderful to see, you know, all the different projects that you've, uh, you've explored in these, in these uh, this past decade. Um, I'd in, I just have a simple question regarding your latest project, the housing project in Mexico. Um, I don't know, I know it's fairly recent, but it, were you able to, given especially so how drastically different it is from everything in its context, in terms of density and uh, in terms of how, it, how people experience it, have you had the opportunity to get any idea of like sort of post-occupancy experience of what people have responded to it, whether it's people who use the building or around? Yeah, I mean, we post like the post occupancy survey in the sense that we understand it is is not something that we have done, but we have been at the opening of the building. We have seen the moving of the first group of um, 
of uh, tenants and users and who were very enthusiastic. We have seen that as the building was going up, we were nervous that they would have moved the market somewhere else because those are organic, you know, uh, forces that you cannot predict. But, uh, you know, they only got more busy, the market, because they know that there are more people who are going to be here, right? So that was very, very good. And um, I think in terms of, uh, post occupancy. I, one thing I also want to mention is that I didn't get too much into it. So this project is funded not by Infonavit, but it's by um, in, Imobi, which is uh, this is municipality level uh, lender. So one one thing that we were very it was very important for us to succeed in this is to also collaborate with the city and at that level to tackle um, housing crisis issues. If we are only relying on the federal and the large scale measures and policies, these things always get out of hands and it's not the real solution that the city at the city level, they realize that they need to understand who are the people who would be getting their funding and getting their loans. And then, you know, also help to manage the building, but also which site is the best site for, for this to be, succeed, right? There's a lot of intelligence from the city side that just cannot be replicated at the federal side. And so, you know, the project need to, we felt very much like there's so much um, innovations already done there before even the architects come to the table. We have to meet that intelligence, right? Like we have to meet uh, the, their, their ambitions with our skills. And I think uh, if I believe the project is a success, they're doing a few more in the city. Um, but I just want to say that the success is not just design alone. It's the design of the entire system and the entire process. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Sure. There's a, there's a question on YouTube, but also one in chat. So I'm just going to combine them. Um, on YouTube, the person says, thank you so much for the great presentation. I was just wondering how you convince communities and clients on the necessity for denser housing in playful shapes, and then in the chat for the housing unit, were you worried about how much it would stand out in the neighborhood? Um, I believe density, you know, is, um, I, I would speak to Florian, for Florian as well, I believe density is one of the necessary um, uh, solution to at least the contemporary, you know, um, environmental and housing crisis and issues. Uh, in, in America, or South America, in, in, for that matter, or in Mexico, Central America, um, and, and the density that people get nervous of is nothing compared to the density that we grew up in, in Asia. Right? Like you can get 10 times more dense and there will still be communities. And it is density is a design issue, I believe, that we have to think about the building shapes, we have to think about the urban forms, we have to think about um, you know, infrastructure, we have to think about the adequate public space, and all of that is a design issue. So I think you know, often you know, the density becomes problematic when we become lazy. So I think that in, in Lyon, it was very much our desire that, you know, if we can contribute to people feeling that, you know, density is okay, and if the design can solve this nervousness towards density in that context, then, you know, we have pushed the needle slightly um, in the right direction, um, because clearly that sprawl, you know, outside of the city is not the solution. Well, thank you so much. It was a, a wonderful lecture. And, and the fortunate thing about having you teaching here is we can keep asking you questions throughout the semester. So I'm sure we'll all have plenty of them. But um, thank you so much. It's really great uh, to see you. And we'll see you here soon. Yeah, very soon. Okay. Thank you.